Let's first deal with the James passage. It is the one most quoted in support of this view. Let's read it again. When you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. Those who doubt should not think that they will receive anything from the Lord. They are double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believe and do not doubt. Now, some of you are sitting there saying, well, Pastor Boyd, how are you going to handle that? That's pretty clear, seems to me. God said it, I believe it. That settles it. <sighs> now, we said this throughout the series. That the main way that scriptures get twisted is by being taken out of context. Always, always, whenever anyone's trying to persuade you of a belief based on this proof text or that proof text, never buy it until you check out the context. Context, context, context. Because the meaning of any sentence is found in the paragraph, and the meaning of every paragraph is found in the whole section the paragraph is part of. It's, you, you can't isolate it. So in this case, if you look at the verse just prior to these two, it reframes the whole thing. Because here's what James says. Verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, oh, that's what he's talking about. <laughs> oh, you should ask God, no one else, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. James is talking about wisdom. He's not talking about asking for a Mercedes Benz or a new house or a new wife or better health or, or anything like that. He's talking specifically about wisdom. He's saying when, when, when you, if you lack wisdom, well, then go only to God for wisdom. And don't waver in your trust that he will give it to you. He wants to give it to you. All right? So it's, it's specifically about wisdom. It can't be generalized to apply to everything whatsoever. It does not support certainty seeking faith. But not only that, though that should be enough, but not only that. There's more. Wait. Um, the word for doubt here is diacrino, and it means to separate, distinguish, to judge, or to evaluate something. Diacrino. When, when it's applied to ideas in your head, it can mean to doubt, because uh, it, it's saying your ideas are separate, and you're evaluating them. You have, you have a duplicity of ideas, and so you're vacillating between them. You're evaluating them. You're wavering. It can mean that. And so if that's the meaning that James intends, what he's saying is when you ask specifically for wisdom, don't be wavering in your mind about whether God wants to give it to you or not. No, trust him, and it will be given to you. But if you're not trusting him, if you're still kind of wavering, well, then it's not going to be given to you. But it can't be applied to everything. And so it doesn't, apply, it doesn't support certainty seeking faith in general. But here's what's really interesting. Diacrino, when it, 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 while it means doubt, while it, if applied to the ideas in your head, in this context, it could mean, I think it's much more likely that it means, don't waver in terms of who you go to to get wisdom. And this fits the whole context of James much better than the doubt interpretation. Because in James, there's this theme about wisdom, seeking wisdom that comes from God. In fact, in chapter 3, he makes a strong contrast between the doubt that comes from above. I mean, the, the doubt. Uh, the, oh, oh, yeah, the NLT translates it this way, uh, where it applies diacrino not to the ideas, but to who you go to. Uh, for to get wisdom. Uh, who you're loyal to is what it comes down to. So it says, when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver for a person with divided loyalty who's seeking different sources of wisdom is as unsettled as the wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. And it's another very plausible, I think more likely, uh, translation of this passage. Because in James, there's a concern for uh, where you go to get wisdom. He distinguishes in chapter 3 between the wisdom that comes from above, uh, that is pure, or peace-loving, and considerate. And then, on the other hand, there's this wisdom that, come, that does not come from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. And he's telling people, if you want wisdom, don't go to the earthly wisdom, the human wisdom, the, the unspiritual and demonic wisdom. Go to the wisdom that comes from above, the wisdom that comes from God, because that's the only wisdom that's considerate and peace-loving. And so given this theme in the book of James, it makes perfect sense that he would open up the book by naming this motif. Folks, if you lack wisdom, go to God alone. And don't be vacillating in terms of where you're going to get your wisdom. Don't try to fuse the wisdom of God with the wisdom from this world. No, only rely on the wisdom that comes from God. And stay clear of the wisdom that comes from the world. Don't mishmash the two together. Stay loyal to God. He alone is to be our source of wisdom. So on that translation, you, you, you have no support whatsoever for this idea that faith is about seeking certainty. So he, here's a second thing I'll say about that's problematic with this psychological concept of faith, the certainty-seeking faith. And that is this. And I mentioned it last week, that in the Bible, the concept of faith is not about your psychology. It's not a psychological concept. It's a covenantal concept. You know, ancient people, in general, were just not into their heads the way we are today. 
in Western culture. We live in this therapeutic culture, psychological, psychoanalytic, psychotherapeutic, psychobabble culture, uh, where you know, everybody's trying to figure out what makes them tick and why they're so screwed up and who are they to blame and why, you know, who put this trigger in my brain. And we're very introspective about that, going to the labyrinth of our brains, trying to find ourselves and all that kind of stuff. We're, in, we're, we're, we're into our heads. So we instinctively think faith is about something in our head. Ancient people weren't like that. Uh, they didn't have therapy back then. When they talk about faith, if, if, when they ask, do you have faith, they're not asking how psychologically certain are you. Like they want to inspect what's going on between your ears. That wasn't their concern at all. When they say, do you have faith, they are asking, are you willing to commit? And biblical faith isn't about seeking psychological certainty, trying to attain certainty. It's about committing to a course of action in the face of uncertainty. And that's why it's called faith, right? Are you willing to commit? Are you at least confident enough to commit to moving in this direction? How certain you are or not is totally irrelevant as long as you're willing to commit. It's what you do with your life that, that, that affects biblical faith, not what's going on between your ears. You can be certain of all the things in the world, but if you're not committed, it's not faith. In fact, James tells us that, that the, the demons, they believe all the right stuff. They've, they, they, they've got an insight on all of that, but it doesn't do them any good because they won't commit to following. They won't act on it. Faith is about acting. It's a pledge to, be tr to trust and, and, and to be trustworthy, even though there's uncertainty involved in this. Just like when you get married. And that's the one covenant we have left. When you say, I do, that's an act of faith. Because you don't know. You can't, you know if, if you're going to get married next week, you might want to close your ears right now, because this could be a spoiler. <laughs> you want to keep on living in your la-la land. Go ahead. But uh, look, at for the rest of us, you can't be certain you're going to be happy ever after. You can't be certain. You may feel certain right now. That's your hormones talking. Uh, yeah, it's, oh, you're so, you know, but um, here's the thing. People do change sometimes for the worse. It's sad, but it happens. They, it, it, it can happen. It takes two to make this thing work, and you can't control the other person. You can't be certain. Oh, my, my spouse would never do that. Well, 48% that got divorced uh, said the same thing once upon a time. Sorry, you can't be certain. And even beyond that, tragedies can happen that, mean, that may make your life together rather miserable. But for all you know, on your honeymoon, your wife or spouse will have a brain aneurysm that totally changes their personality, and they become mean and nasty and vile and whatever. You know, and now you're stuck with that. So much for happy ever after. And if you would, could have known that that was going to happen ahead of time, if that had been a fact that you could get in on, you wouldn't have got married. But that's why marriage is a risk. It is a risk, but... Some of us would say it's worth it. <laughs> and, and all love involves risk, and all commitments involve risk. It's, it's a risk that God took when he created us. There's a risk involved in this, but it's worth it. So you love the person enough to say, I'm willing to take this risk, and that's why it's faith. You commit to a course of action. You can believe all the right things in the world about this person, but you're not acting in faith until you, you pledge to be committed to them and to trust them. Uh, and now that's what biblical faith is all about. Not what's going on between your ears, what you're doing with your life. And think about this. If faith is necessary because there's uncertainty, the very definition of faith presupposes uncertainty, then what are we to make of certainty seeking faith? Faith that seeks certainty. It is by definition faith that's seeking to not be faith. Faith that's trying to be faithless. What they call strong faith is a lack of faith. Uh, self, self, certainty seeking faith is a contradiction in terms, which is just one more reason to conclude it is twisted. It's twisted and it's unbiblical and it's contradictory and it's not what we're supposed to be doing. And so many people are in bondage to this, trying to make themselves certain of things uh, that they don't need to be concerned with. Um, no, it, it's, it's acting in the face of uncertainty. And it's okay to know that. I'm not certain, but I... I I'm not certain of anything, but I'm willing to bet my life on things. And that's what I'm doing up here right now. I'm betting my life that Jesus Christ is Lord, rose from the dead, all that. It's a rational belief. God never asked us to shoot out our brains. I got good reasons for believing this. But I'm willing to bet my life on it. I'm going to live this way. I'll live as if it's true because I believe it's true. And I've got good reasons for it. But certainty, nah, nah I don't have certainty. So here, here's, here, here's the thing. I'll leave with two admonitions. Number one, uh, I leverage everything on Jesus Christ and him crucified. I encourage you, know why you believe that. And there's very good, compelling reasons for that. We've got some books out there that will help you. If, if you're questioning that, then, then investigate it. God doesn't ask us to shoot out our brains. He says, come let us reason. Uh, Jesus gave uh, the uh, people, uh, it says in Acts in chapter 1, uh, many proofs that he was, in fact, raised from the dead and he was the son of God. No, there's good reasons for this. It's not an irrational thing. It's a very rational thing. It's just that you've got to go beyond the evidence in order to embrace it and commit to it. 
Uh, know why you believe that. Make that the center of everything. Because see, if that's the center of everything, well, that's your only source of life, which means you could be wrong about every other opinion you have, and you're still, you're still going to be okay. So if you have doubts about other things, it's not that big of a deal. I get so grieved when people reject their faith in Christ because of, they took a course and they found out that uh, one story in the Bible is not historical or something that's not to be taken literal. Or they can't integrate Genesis 1 with evolutionary theory or whatever. And then they get rid of the whole thing. I, I, I'm planes and malls, I, I meet people who tell me this. Oh, I used to be a Christian, but then I found out there's a contradiction. Or the, and my response is, why would you give up on your relationship with Christ because of that? Now, there are, I think, I found, usually answers to those kind of questions. Uh, not always traditional answers, but they're p good answers uh, I I if you're patient with it. But even more importantly, I can give you a ton of reasons for believing Jesus Christ is Lord and died, and that was a revelation of God's character, and that's what he thinks about you, that have nothing to do with that stuff and aren't affected by that. So settle the center. Get your center down, and the rest is kind of like gravy, which leads to the second point of admonition, and that is be okay with questions and ambiguities. Uh, you know, just deal with stuff, but, but be, get your life from Christ and, and, and be calm about it. You know, it's okay. You see, the thing is, certainty seeking faith is tidy. It likes everything clean and obvious and tidy. Because that's the only way you can be certain. It's obvious. Which means if you don't agree with me, you obviously are immoral or something, because any rational person could see this. So they impose clarity uh, on a world that is actually very ambiguous. Certainty seeking faith is always clean and clear and obvious. Biblical faith never is. Read the Bible. It's messy. It's messy. It deals with a lot of ambiguity. Have you ever noticed how many questions there are raised by people in the Bible that don't get answered? A ton of them, which means God must really like them because they're in the Bible. They're, they're part of God's word. He's okay with questions, folks. He's okay with doubts. Uh, he, he's not like some theology prof up in heaven on steroids who, who, who is just trying to cram us full of all the right answers to theological questions and then is going to grade us and send us to heaven or hell based on how many we get right. No, he's our heavenly bridegroom who will do and has done everything he could possibly do to enter into a loving relationship with us. And he doesn't mind doubts and he doesn't mind questions. He just wants our heart. He says, in the midst of your questions and doubt, will you give me your heart? Will you just pledge yourself to me? Pour yourself out to me the way I poured myself out for you. That, that's what it's about, folks. Um, and we don't have to have all the answers. We're not called to be the people who have all the right answers to everything, let alone who are certain they have all the right answers to everything. That is, folks, the people are sincere and wonderful, but they, they, and they don't realize it, but that is so arrogant. Oh, you're the one person who was taught all the right truth, nothing but the truth in seventh grade. Wow, well, how nice for you. Which is what the other 10 million people think as well, and that's why they go to war and kill each other. You know, it can't all be correct. No, it, 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 we're human beings. We don't know much. Uh, but, but we've got reason to be confident of this one thing, Jesus Christ and him crucified. Uh, Paul said, I resolved to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. If we've got that, I've got my life. I, got, I, I don't need to be getting life from all these other beliefs. I could be wrong about them all. So I don't need to defend or get angry if I'm proven wrong or someone challenges me. No. Or if I don't have an answer to something. You know, for a long time, I didn't have any answer to the question, how do you reconcile the God of the Old Testament with the God, the violent God that you find in some passages of the Old Testament with the, the nonviolent God revealed on the cross? I didn't know. I thought I had answers until I started to write a book on it and then discovered I don't. They don't work. Halfway through the book, it's like, this is so unconvincing. Uh, I, I, it sounded so much better before I started writing it. So I had to scrap the thing. Seven years ago, I had to scrap the whole thing. But I resolved to trust that God looks like Jesus Christ dying on the cross. And it was when I resolved to trust that God looks like Jesus Christ dying on the cross, even when portraits of him in the Bible don't, don't cohere with that, that I began to see a very different way of interpreting them as I read the Bible through the lens of the cross. It just kind of arose out of the Bible like one of those magic eye books, you know, where you look at it a certain way, all of a sudden there's a three-dimensional picture. It's like, whoa, whoa, check out that. Now, is it revelation or delusion? I don't know. Uh, am I certain about it? Absolutely not. Uh, no, of course I'm not certain. I'm a human. Um, but it strikes me as the most plausible, godly, Christ-centered way of reading the Old Testament that there is. And there'll be the watchdogs that will call me a heretic for it. You know, you're a heretic. I'm, I, I've already said it. Uh, but it's ridiculous. And I don't get life from what they think about me anyway, so do I care. But um, if something comes along that's better and more plausible, I'll junk what I've done now, and I'll grab onto that. And it will be bug me that I spent eight years on this thing. But it won't affect me as a person because I don't get life from that. I can be wrong about that. I just am going to get it off from Jesus Christ and him crucified. So be okay with the questions and ambiguities. That's why we have Q&As around here all the time. Uh, we think they're good because God thinks they're good. Use your mind. It's an act of worship to think. Jesus says, worship God with all your spirit, soul, and, and mind. Spirit and, and mind. Uh, it's, it's, we do that. The mind thinks. And thinking about this stuff is an act of worship.